everybody and welcome to the Parker Manatee Rehabilitation Habitat. We are a second stage rehab through the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership, which is a collection of different organizations dedicated to helping manatees. As a second stage facility, we will get manatees from hospitals once they receive the critical treatment they need but are not quite ready to be released back to the wild. So that could mean a number of things. It could mean that they need some more time to put on some weight and build on life skills if they were orphaned. Uh, maybe they had a, a very severe injury out in the wild and they need a little bit more time to heal. Or they could also be here if red tide is present in their release site. So all manatees are just a little bit different. But we do get them for a variety of reasons. Now, when manatees are rescued out in the wild, it's always critical for them. So a hospital is their first stop, and that is where they will receive their critical treatment, which includes um, any um, wound treatment, um, any tube feeding, bottle feeding, just depending on what their situation is. And then uh, a lot of times adults can be released back to the wild from those hospitals once they're ready, and um, usually we'll get the younger animals, but that's not always the case. So we currently have three manatees and they're here for different reasons. Um, we have Viva, Dozcal, and Felicia. And Viva was rescued for red tide illness, which is one of the two natural threats that they face. Red Tide releases a neurotoxin. So uh, for those of you that don't know, it is an algae that blooms out in the waterways. It naturally occurs out there um, about 40 miles off the coast. And once it hits the coastline, it does usually have access to limiting nutrients that it doesn't typically have. So it kind of um, can have the ability to bloom more than it usually does. And that will cause respiratory issues for people, but when it, when it blooms, it releases a neurotoxin that actually causes manatees to have seizures and uh, paralysis. Um, they can exhibit a comatose-like state, so it really just depends on the manatee. But what's happening is when that neuro neurotoxin is released, the plants that they're eating out in the wild, um, because they are herbivores, they are absorbing that neurotoxin. And so they're ingesting that without knowing, and then it targets their nervous system. So red tide can be deadly for manatees, and when Viva was found, she was actually um, not responsive. So she wasn't moving or anything like that, um, but she was able to be rescued, which is great. Now, usually with a red tide manatee, they'll go to a hospital where they will receive their care. Um, they'll typically be in a very shallow pool because it takes a while, um, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours for red tide to get rid from their systems. So during that time, they will still exhibit symptoms of red tide. So those, those seizures that I mentioned, um, maybe being paralyzed. So it's very important for them to not have to struggle too much when they have to come up to breathe. So they'll be in a shallow pool so that they can do it themselves if they can. Um, they'll also have uh, someone watching them 24 hours a day until it's gone, just keeping a close eye on them so they're not struggling too much. Now, um, after red tide's gone from their systems and they're nice and healthy, a lot of times they can be released from those hospitals. But Viva is very small, um, or she was very small when she was rescued. She's not a small girl anymore. Um, so that was uh, kind of an indication that she could have been orphaned as a calf because she fell within the range of orphan calves when she was rescued. So for her, she will actually stay here for a little bit until next winter, until she is big enough to go out um, and that way we will know if she, um, or will allow her to understand warm versus cold water. I mentioned that they have two natural threats. I talked a little bit about red tide. The other natural threat that manatees have is cold stress. Now cold stress is something that can be very severe for them. Uh, the first thing that happens to them when they get too cold, because it is caused from cold water, is um, they'll turn white in different areas. Sometimes they'll have little marks all over their bodies, pock marks, they look kind of like chicken pox, they're white. Um, or it could be the front of their face, their flippers and their tail, because once they start to get too cold, their body core will start to, or the, their bodies will start to shunt their blood or push their blood, move their blood from different areas to try to keep them warm. So those are the first areas that start to lack circulation. So they turn white and they'll eventually become necrotic. Um, uh, cold stress is a lot like frostbite, hypothermia, and pneumonia kind of rolled into one. Um, so they can develop respiratory issues, their organs will eventually start to shut down the longer they're in cold water. And this typically starts occurring um, in November, December when the water temperatures drop because their uh, cold tolerance, or uh, they're cold intolerant and their tolerance is about 68 degrees. So anything below 68 degrees is when they will start to develop, develop those symptoms. So when we have manatees that were orphaned or potentially orphans, it's really important for us to release them in the winter because that is a time when manatees are aggregating. 
They're going to power plants, they're going to warm springs because those areas are going to be warmer for them. They're going to be, you know, 72 degrees or maybe a little bit warmer, but they will be able to call, tolerate those temperatures. Um, now, usually manatees learn that from their mom. So manatees, when they're born, they'll typically stay with mom anywhere from one to two years. And during this time, they learn everything that they have to know before they go out on their own. And one of the most important things they learn is how to find warm water. So mom will take them into a power plant or a warm spring and when they go in there with her, uh, they will go from colder water into warmer water and that is what helps them to imprint. Now imprinting takes place and then after they leave their mother, instinctively every year when it starts to get cold, they know exactly where they have to go and they'll go back to those areas. Now if they don't make it to one of those power plants or warm springs, they can get cold stress and they can actually die from that. It can be fatal if it gets too severe um, or they're not able to be rescued if nobody finds them out in the waterways. So it's really important for us to set our manatees up for success, not just those that are orphaned, but all of them. Um, and we release them in those power plants and warm springs so that if they don't understand warm versus cold water, then hopefully they will after being released there. Now, when we do release them into those power plants and warm springs, um, they will get satellite tracking equipment. So they will be tracked for about a year and there's an organization that monitors them for an entire year. So not just satellite tracking, but also visual. Uh, they'll get visuals on those manatees to know what they're doing out there, if their behavior is normal, uh, making sure that they're eating and making sure that they're doing well out there. So um, it is a very big deal. So they will be followed for a year and tracked for a year. And then when winter rolls around again the next year, we'll know if they imprinted because they'll go back to that same place. And then that tracking equipment can be removed. So that will happen for Viva. So she will be released next winter when she's a little bit bigger. Um, now I say bigger because a lot of times with younger animals, we want them to be about 600 pounds before they're released. Um, now every manatee is a little bit different. So that's not always the case, but it usually is. Um, so we want her to be a little bit bigger before she goes out um, next winter. So right now she's probably around 400, 450 pounds, somewhere around there. So she will, she'll be a nice, she'll have a nice round belly when she goes out next winter. Now, um, Dose Cal is a manatee that we have that was actually orphaned. He was found very emaciated out in the waterways uh, near Fort Myers, and he was uh, just very skinny. So he was sick out there, he hadn't eaten for a while, so he was rescued, um, and it, they found out that he was actually very small. He fell within that um, orphan calf size as well. So when he's released, he'll be released next winter also, um, and he will be released at the Fort Myers power plant. Now, the other manatee that we have is Felicia. Now, Felicia was also rescued as an orphan calf, but her story is very different because she was rescued with her mother. So she's listed as an orphan, um, but at the time of rescue, her mother was still alive. And anytime there's a mom and calf together, even if one isn't sick or injured, it doesn't matter. They'll try to keep both of them together because that bond is so important. They never want to separate a manatee calf and mom uh, before, before they're ready. So they were able to rescue both, but unfortunately her mom had very severe watercraft related injuries and she didn't make it. So that is why Felicia is now an orphan. Uh, we are hopefully going to release her, her here in a little while. Um, we have no date for that, but hopefully soon um, when she's a little bit bigger. Um, but after that, um, we'll continue to get manatees in here because manatees always need help. They're always being rescued. Um, manatees have a lot of uh, other threats that aren't natural. So red tide and cold stress are the two natural threats they have. Um, everything else usually is related to people. So watercraft collision is the number one cause of mortality every year. Um, so it's always very important when we're out on any waterways, especially right now when more people are trying to get out on boats and be out in the waterways, that we're just being vigilant. We're obeying manatee speed zones. We're looking out for them. Um, wearing polarized sunglasses also helps a lot to eliminate the glare off the water so you can see them more easily. And having a spotter, that will also help so that if there is a manatee in the area, someone can see it and let you know so you can slow down and keep an eye out for them. Manatees can also get entangled in things, so things like crab traps and fishing line especially, but also um, ropes, nets, fishing gear, anything that's out there in the waterways that's hanging or dangling that could potentially get caught around their flippers um, or their tails, and a lot of times that will happen when they're eating. So they do use their flippers a lot like we use our hands, and sometimes they'll pull food into their mouths like this. And unfortunately, if there's any monofilament line in the water or crab traps around, they can get those wrapped around their flippers. So just making sure that we're providing them with the safest and cleanest home possible is always the best idea. Stash your trash, know what you're going out with, and dispose of everything properly, even monofilament fishing line. Um, and just make sure that if you do see manatees out in the wild, that you practice passive observation. 
They are federally protected and also protected by the state. So please do not touch them, feed them, give them water, chase them, harass them. Anything that disturbs or disrupts their natural behavior is illegal to do. Just make sure that you're um, observing their beauty from a distance. And they are beautiful creatures. Uh, if you folks have any questions about our manatees or manatees in general, just leave a comment in the comment box below.